Okay then, so let's uh, think about what it was we did yesterday. Okay. So I started out by telling you about ordinary modal boxes and diamonds. And remember the intuition I gave you? A diamond was the symbol that we prefix in front of some piece of information, some proposition. And we're standing in the graph, and a diamond is essentially a search instruction. It's to say, we're standing at this node, look at all the transitions that are possible to us. Can I take one of these transitions? Can I make one of these transitions and get to another, probably different node, but maybe the same one that makes the information fly true? And the box operator was what's called the dual of that. If I'm standing at a node and I assert box phi, what that means is, hey, it doesn't matter which transition I take, all transitions lead to the phi information. So I told you about that, and I tried very much to emphasize the intuition that in modal logic, we stand inside our graphs. We stand inside our relational structures, our Kripke models. And then basically I tried to tell you, isn't modal logic nice? And I told you, well, it's decidable, and first order logic ain't. And I told you that actually this nice little Modal operators are just little animals or little automata living in graphs. That's not an intuition. That's a clue that opens you up for the idea of a bisimulation, which in turn tells you what modal logic is. And the answer I gave you to what modal logic is was the answer given by the Van Benton characterization theorem. <coughs> it starts from the realization that when we're talking about graphs, we can do so in so many ways. We could use an infinitary language, we could use a first order language, we could use a second order language, we could use a higher order language, we could use a modal language, we could use a god knows what language. Okay? All these different formal systems. But one of the quotations I gave you, one of the slogans I gave you when we started this talk was modal languages. And in fact, every logic, every logic, no, no particular logic should be thought of as an isolated <coughs> formal system. Systematically, you should try to measure how these different languages differ and what they can say about the very same structures. To put it another way, you know, you've probably all heard about the Eskimos with 150 names of snow, which has been beautifully, there's a beautiful article by Jeffrey Fuller about why you should not think in terms of the Eskimos and their 150 names for, for snow. But in linguistics, there is this idea of the sapir dwarf hypothesis, mm -hmm. that the limits of our language determine the limits of our world. Now, let's not get into the merits or otherwise of that in linguistics. But in logic, it's just a fact. That is what model theory in one sense, or one branch of model theory is about. You can be talking about the same kind of graph, but you can do so in different ways, and the different languages probably see different things. OK? So the Wolf hypothesis, it's a fact for logic. It's one of the most fundamental model theoretic facts. OK? Anyway, basically, the Van Benton theorem Modal logic is the bi-simulate, it's the bit of, modal logic is really the bit of first order logic that can't tell by similar models apart, exactly that bit. <laughs> um, and then, of course, I played bad boy, you know. I started telling you that, oh, there's all these things that modal logics can't do, and in fact there's this funny asymmetry at the heart of modal logic, this blindness in orthodox modal logic. Orthodox modal languages cannot see the nodes. And so we fixed it. We added these things called nominals, propositional symbols, true at one point. We added the at i operators. I mean, once you add nominals, you know, the world practically screams at you to add the at i operators. So we introduced those. And then everything was dinky do again. OK, we could do all the reference we wanted. Where are we doing modal logic? Yes, it's decidable. Yes, we've got by simulations. And we really are modal because the Van Benton characterization theorem comes back, but not just for first order logic, but first order logic with quality and constant symbols. So we're pretty much back, and everything's happy. But I also said there was a certain sort of boringness in what I said yesterday, in that, so to speak, we had a problem A to fix. I brought along a problem A fixer, and problem A was fixed. Okay? <laughs> Let's sort of see what this machinery does when we look at it for different things. And what I want to talk about is hybrid deduction. Now, there's lots of else that could be said about deduction, and I will be saying some of these things. 
I'm going to be talking, I'm going to basically be giving you a sort of example-driven introduction to a hybrid tableau. The way I'm going to do this, I'm going to talk about the goals and the problems of ordinary modal deduction. Okay? And then I'm going to start presenting hybrid tableau systems for reasoning about these models. And first of all, for ordinary unstructured models. And then I'm gradually going to show you how you can get a little bit more and a little bit more. And I'm going to end up saying some very, very general things and even a few words about the computational consequences of this, or rather what has been done in a computational setting with this. Okay, but let's just take it a bit at a time. Now, here's one of the most <coughs> fundamental facts about modal logic. This is a historical fact, and one part of me really wonders whether this is a good way of thinking about it at all, okay, whether this is a good thing. There ain't one modal logic. There's many. I mean, if you really want to get technical about it, there's uncountably many. Okay? But most of them don't have names. Okay? <laughs> but you've probably heard of the names of some of them. You've probably heard of names like K and S4 and S5 and the Lerm logic or the Duodell logic, etc. or S4.3 or... Modal logicians are not tremendously inventive when it comes to names. <laughs> okay? Now, why is this? Here's the first answer. I think I'll be able to sort of give you another slant on it by the end of the lecture. I've tried to say that modal languages are tools we use for talking about graphs. But they're also a logic. So when we are talking about a certain kind of graph, we would like to know, how can I put it? If I restrict my attention to these graphs, what follows logically? Okay? What's real? What's valid? Okay? And that is really the point. If we allow ourselves to talk about arbitrary graphs or possible graphs, then we're, so to speak, in the minimal modal logic. There are no extra assumptions. Any graph is a model. Any graph is good. Nothing particular structure, no particular structure going on. Now, just to give you an example of the sort of formula that is valid on all this, just to test your intuitions, is it blindingly obvious that this first formula here is valid on any graph at all? And again, to check validity, what you have to do is you have to jump into an arbitrary graph and you have to look at it. So you're standing there, and you look at the antecedent, and it says box P. And that means here I am standing, all the transitions I can see lead to a P state. And the second conjunction says, all the transitions I can see lead to a Q state. And the conclusion is, all the transitions I can see lead to a state where P and Q is true. Happy? Is that a clearly a validity? Yeah. It is. And it's a validity on any graph. I didn't have to appeal to any special reasoning. It's true because yada, 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 yada. I mean, it was clearly straightforward, purely logical reasoning in some sense. Contrast this with this next second formula. This is diamond, diamond, P implies diamond, P. Okay? So that's saying you're standing in a graph. You can make a transition to another world. So hop, you make a diamond move. And then from there, boom, I can make another diamond move. And hey, I reach a point where P is true. So here I am. I hop to that table. I hop to that table. And I pick up a P on the top of that rope, that table <coughs> behind me. Therefore, I can make a single hop and pick up a P. Hmm, is that true? Is that always going to be true on any arbitrary model? Well, no. I mean, what about this one? I mean, just to be as sort of brutally silly as possible. Here's a transition to here, here's a transition to here. There ain't no other transitions. And P is true here at nowhere else. So it is certainly true that if I'm standing here, Okay, diamond, diamond P. But diamond, diamond P is certainly, so diamond, diamond P, that's certainly true. Hop, hop. But diamond P isn't. Okay? And as you probably read on the slide, we would have a guarantee of truth if whenever I saw this pattern, I had that pattern. In other words, we would have the guarantee of the validity of this formula if we knew that our underlying graph was transitive. But please note, that's an extra assumption. It's a validity if we, ex if we restrict attention to the transitive models. But that's really the point I'm making. And that really is kind of the history of modal logic. 
Modal logicians realized fairly early, but certainly after Kripke introduced the possible world semantics, that A, many of the differences that had already been observed in modal logics corresponded to fairly simple, or often fairly simple, sort of structural differences in the models you were interested in. You're interested in transitive models, you're interested in reflexive models, and so on. And that by looking at these, they could distinguish logics, get completeness theorems, and so on and so forth. Added to this, there was the point that when modal logicians use modal logic, it's not always clear how you want to model something. I mean, the traditional application for modal logic, and in one of my, in my opinion, one of the least interesting and least successful, is viewing diamond and box as the possibly and the necessity operator. Okay? So box P, true at all possible worlds, means necessarily true. Diamond P, truth at some possible worlds, means possibly true. Now the point is, if you start writing down plausible, okay, some things are fairly easy. If, if P is necessarily true, does P have to be true? So does box P imply P? <coughs> yeah, most people would say yes. But is it always true that if it's necessary, if it's possible that P is necessarily true, that P is necessarily true? I don't know. Does anybody? The nice thing about the Kripke semantics was you were able to convert these kind of questions, which once you start embedding modalities one inside the other, into sort of simple geometric facts, so to speak. Okay? So many logics seemed interesting. You move to, say, epistemic applications. You move to temporal applications. Logics anywhere, everywhere or different. So much for background, but this certainly has, so to speak, how can I put it, a methodological impact on the way modal logicians regarded us. So to speak, if you're a modal logician, say back in the 60s, your task wasn't to say, give a proof system for logic A or logic B. I mean, easily done, okay? In a sense, your task was to try and get something general, some kind of general method, that with the help of this general method, you would be able to sort of get nice logics for just about anything. Okay? So you've got these basic tools, and some philosopher comes along and says, I really think we should think, say, about the logic of obligation, and this way it seems to be new, and then you can go out with your toolbox and work out what the requisite logic is. General tools were sought for. Okay? Now, in a way, they succeeded. Okay? It was dirty, and it was mean, and it was, but it was a success in a way. How modal logicians <coughs> succeeded was they made use of the proof system called a Hilbert system or an axiom system. Now, oh, how can I put it? Axiom systems are the simplest sort of proof system that's available. Okay? The basic idea is you have some bunch of axioms, and these are formulas that are just valid. And you've got some rules for generating new stuff out of old. Okay, so you can start with the axioms, they're the foundation, and by instantiating these axioms and applying rules of proof, you make new stuff. Okay? So typical rules of inference was if you've proved that phi implies psi, and you've approved and you've proved phi, then you can prove psi. I.e., you've got modus permanence. Okay? The trouble is that axiom systems can be very, very hard to use. For example, I won't try and give you this example. Uh, it's very, very easy to write down some quite elegant-looking axiomatizations for propositional logic. And then you can say, so one of the best-known axiomatizations for propositional logic, it's very elegant. And then you ask, how do you prove P implies P in this axiom system? And wow, it is a highly non-technical, a highly non-trivial exercise. <laughs> the point is that axiom systems, in a sense, take some class of validities as given, for what reason? They've got simple ways of generating new stuff out of old. But if somebody gives you a formula and say, I know it's valid, I did the truth table, show me how you prove it, it's not clear what they do at all. Because an axiom system does not look at the structure of the formula you are given and go to work on that. In a sense, it's kind of like, that's the formula you're given to prove, and you've got to keep glancing over your shoulder and say, shit, what was that? <laughs> okay, what, what can I do to these damn axioms that might kind of take me that? What was that formula again? Uh, uh, well, if I go, and go oh, what? Oh, uh, etc. <laughs> now, there's an axiom system called K, 
which in generally in modal logic looks like this. So actually you've got the formula that I gave you yesterday. Uh, okay, so basically you've got enough axioms to generate propositional calculus. I don't really care how you do it, okay? You've got this schema that I discussed yesterday, the K schema. And remember what I said yesterday, this basically says even when your information is hidden by a level of boxes, you can still do modus ponens. So if you've got phi implies psi, you've got phi, then you've got psi. So that's sort of the way it works. And you've got another rule of inference that if you can prove, so semantically, if this is valid, if you can prove phi, then you can prove box phi. Okay? This is called the system K, and basically it can generate all the validities on all graphs in the basic, well in this case one modality, but if you want 15 modalities, it's easy to make it work for that as well. Language. Okay? Cool. You've got that. And then the basic idea was the way that K would work is that by adding further axioms like the transitivity axiom, you get the logic by adding an extra axiom, you get the logic that works for that class of models. Okay? Ah, what can you say about this strategy? Well, I said the first part. Okay, Hilbert systems are hard to use. So actually, you did get some fairly general stuff. There are some famous general completeness theorems. General completeness theorems are the effect that start with K. If your axiom has this particular syntactic shape and you add it here, then you get completeness with respect to this class of models. Okay? But probably the most famous example of this are the so-called Salkvist theorems. Those are easier ones than that. These are typically quite difficult theorems to prove, incidentally. They're non-trivial. Okay? But it is, I think, utterly fair to say that although they brought quite a lot of generality, and they don't think they got as much generality as they would have liked, okay, the resulting systems are very, very hard to use. And this, so what I'm basically sort of saying is modal logicians wanted lot completeness results, they wanted logics for lots of different kinds of graphs. They went out and got it, but they did so in a, in a way that kind of tied their hands behind their backs. <coughs> okay? These rather difficult to use social <coughs> systems. And this of course leads to the question, why? Was this just some stupid, dumb accident of fortune? Actually it wasn't, because actually Kripke, for example, used Tableau in one of his very first papers on modal logic. No, there's a deeper reason, okay? There's a deeper reason, okay? The deeper reason is this. Let me come back and just tell you a little thing about other proof systems. I've told you a little bit about axiom systems, and I hope you'll always remember to the day you die how you work the axiom system here, and you're always nervously looking over at your shoulder at the target you're trying to hit, a bit like playing darts in the dark, all right? Real proof systems, like natural deduction systems, or tableau systems, or sequence systems, don't work like that. You kind of keep your eye firmly fixed on the wall. Now, for example, to prove P implies P in a natural deduction system, probably everybody knows this, you, well, you assume P, well, you deduce P, you discharge, and you've got P implies P, three lines, okay? To try and prove P implies P in a tableau system, you put not P implies P, and you sort of say, oh, oh, okay. So that means that uh, P has got to be true and P has got to be false. So you've got a contradiction here. And again, you just close that tableau. The point is, these kind of real proof systems, they make use of the structure of the formula. Okay? Well, why didn't people just do this in modal logic? Why not have a tableau system? Because you know, the tableau rules are so nice. I guess you probably have heard of them. You'll see them later. You're making this tableau, and you've got the information phi and psi on the tableau. What do you do? You throw away the end, and you deduce your phi and your psi. Oh. <laughs> We've got a phi or psi in a tableau. What do you do? Well, you say, well, it could be phi, or it could be psi. Let's go on. You, know, you break down the structure, you throw away the that's the problem. You can't get behind the bloody diamonds. You can't get at the information behind the bloody diamonds. That's it in a nutshell. Okay? 
you can't get behind the diamonds. You're happily working your way down a tableau. And you come to this woman with diamond five. Now maybe it's diamond P. Or maybe it's diamond yada 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 things with lots of embedded symbols. It doesn't matter. You've got to get rid of that diamond and get to work on the information that comes after the diamond. How do you do it? The honest answer is, if you're lucky and you're working in a pretty good logic, let's say S4, and you're not too fussy, there are ways of doing it. Or you might come up with a way of doing it, say, in S5. But there is no general way of doing it in orthodox modal logic. You can't get behind the diamonds. Okay? And indeed, modal proof theory, orthodox modal proof theory, I do not know how many papers I've had to referee say on yet another proof system for S4. I'm not laughing at such papers, but I mean, again, modal proof theory really is concentrated on this. Proof theory is hard. We are focusing on individual logics because proof theory can be made to work for individual logics, and that sacrifices the generality. So you see, caught between a rock and a hard place. Okay? By the way, isn't it annoying? Have you heard of a language called... Um, First of all, logic, pretty good logic. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's much stronger than this modal rubbish, okay? It's, it's the one with the upside down A's and the backward E's and all that sort of rubbish. And you know, these guys don't have any problem at all. In fact, there's even a way of teaching the subject. You're doing these tableau systems and you're breaking down your hands and you're breaking down the balls, and suddenly you come to the existential quantifier. There you are on your tableau, the existential is facing you, okay? And are you scared? Do you suddenly sweat and think, I don't know what to say to my class? No, you don't. You don't. You know what you say. There exists the next five. Our oh, class, um, we basically throw away the existential quantifier and we invent a brand new name and we substitute for the new variable. Okay? Let's call this new person Vera. We don't know anything about Vera, but now we substitute Vera for X in this and we carry on. Okay? Now you don't have a problem. And as we saw yesterday, they live upstairs. They're strong. We live downstairs in modal logic. What's going on? Okay. So this is really the observation that lies behind hybrid deduction. It's based on a very simple observation that actually it's incredibly easy to strip the diamonds away. In fact, there's many, many ways of doing it. I'm just going to give you the way that I like to do it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you this idea in the setting of Tableau. Okay. This is the first one, but actually it's been used in just about every proof style. Natural deduction, sequent resolution, display calculi, and so on. Okay? Moreover, moreover, once you have got your basic machinery here, once you've got your basic deduction system for the minimal language, there is a uniform way of getting general completeness theorem for many other frame classes, and it's not difficult, like the Salkvist theorem or anything like that. It's simple. Okay? Basically, you can prove one completeness theorem, which, so to speak, with just a little bit of extra work, you suddenly realize, hey, this ain't one completeness theorem. This is infinitely many completeness theorem for infinitely many different classes of graphs. Okay? So let's see how we do this. Moreover, and this is me being silly, by the way, so just let me be silly. <laughs> Modal deduction, sorry, I should say hybrid reasoning is very, very natural. And I think you could almost claim that it kind of follows natural reasoning. And just to give you an example, I'm going to sort of show you this argument. And just to emphasize once more that modal logic ain't necessarily about intentional phenomena. Okay, so it doesn't have to be about necessity and epistemic logic or even time, but it can be about, say, all the people in this room and this very extensional model. I'm going to give you this argument. If everyone you hate is hip and someone you hate is cute, then someone you hate is both hip and cute. And so, writing it down like this, everyone you hate is hip, and here's a diamond, so that's a someone you hate is cute, implies someone you hate is both hip and cute. Now, Tableau basically works by assuming the opposite and deriving a contradiction. Let's just see how this would work informally. Okay. Suppose if everyone you hate is hip, and someone you hate is cute, then someone you hate is both hip and cute, what I wrote on the last slide, is not true, because I'm aiming to get a contradiction. Well, let's spell that out. What does that mean? 
breaking down. Well, then, one, everyone you hate is him. And two, someone you hate is cute. However, no one you hate is both hip and cute. Everybody so far with me? We good? Okay. okay. Now, here's the move. Someone you hate is hip and cute. Let's go back to the first logic part. Someone we hate, so what is it? There's someone you hate, I know. Let's call him a Joe. Okay? We hate Joe. Okay. I don't know why, I've never really figured it out, but I feel it. Okay? <laughs> oh, that's no, Jim, sorry. Joe I like. Joe I like. It's Jim. <laughs> Damn, I shot the wrong guy last night. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a bitch, yeah. Anyway, but, but as Jim is someone you hate, he will be hip as well as cute. Because everyone you hate is hip. Alright? Okay. And then... But Jim can't be both hip and cute. For well, no one you hate is both hip and cute. Contradiction, so the original sentence was true after all. Are we okay? Let's see how this looks in Tableau. Okay. That's what we want to do, and the first step in any Tableau is we try to falsify it. But please note one little detail. This negation on the outside is clearly intended to falsify the sentence. Please note these Tableau work internally. It's kind of like saying, it is not, okay, this formula is not true, and I'm going to show you by falsifying it at some brand new node in some unspecified no, no, uh, model called I. Okay? So we're falsifying it at I. And actually, I is a good choice of nominal, but I can also read it as the personal pronoun that we all can, and we can read our axioms. So we're falsifying this. And the first step of the proof is simply this. Can somebody explain to me why the first step of the proof should be like that? So we're falsifying a conditional at a point called I, and I suddenly pull out two formulas like that. Can somebody explain to me why I pulled out those formula? Implication Sorry? Implication and Exactly. Remember, to falsify an implication, you make the antecedent true. So we've got at I, the antecedent must be true. And at I, the consequent must be false. Is that okay? Then I do another thing there. Can somebody tell me what I did there and where it came from? From, from two, you are. Exactly, from two. At I, I've got two pieces of information. At I, I hate everyone who's hip and I hate someone who's cute. It's a conjunction. And how do you break down a conjunction? You assert those conjuncts. So, um, I hate everyone who's hip, and I hate someone who's cute. Okay? Here comes Jim. Okay. Now, which line did this come from? Can anybody tell me? It comes from here. Okay? Here we're asserting at I, At I, I hate someone who's cute. And this is worth a little diagram. Okay, this is worth a little diagram because this is the crucial rule. And if you've got this, there's not really much more to tell you. Okay? So we're basically saying that at I, there's the hate relation. So this is I. There's a hate relation. So we've got, uh, I'm sorry. Let me start like this. We're sort of asserting that at the node I, okay, I can make a diamond, I can make a hate transition and see the information cute. And I'm in a tableau, so what do I essentially do? I do two things. I do the breakdown. I say, well, look, I'm making a sort of transition assertion. So let's just boing, say, well, yes, I have to make a hate transition. And, oh, I don't know what to call this node by reasoning about people. I know, let's call it Jim because I hate him. Okay. And then I assert, and at Jim, cute. In other words, I've broken, remember, this may not look like a big game, but this could have been that you hate, and then a very, very big, long formula here. What you're doing is, if at I, you have to make a diamond transition to some information, you get rid of this thing here, okay? 
here we've got at i, I can make a transition to acute state. What you do is you say at i, I can make a hate transition, and I give that state a brand new name. Okay, I think of it cute, but this is really just a nominal. And then I say, and at that state, I have cuteness. In other words, I've broken this statement down into the transition part and the assert what's new at this newly christened point part. And in general, it won't just be stuff like cute. I mean, that could be some horrendously long formula, and they only have the horrendously long formula here. But now we've got a new nominal here, and we start chopping it chopping apart that new formula. Is that clear? This is the heart of it. Believe me, you're going to be seeing this again. I okay. think what's hard for me is that I get confused about the predicate versus nominal part, the acute versus the gym part, right? So. That actually then, though, I mean, in a way, you're meant to be confused because, oh. uh, in, a, in, fact, in fact, the heart of hybrid logic is a sort of systematic confusion between terms and formulas. I mean, sure. <laughs> the, heart of, the heart of hybrid logic is systematic confusion. And it's okay, so. <laughs> okay. And just rounding this out, so at gym hip. So why does gym have the property of being hip? Can anybody tell me? Uh, line three. three. Not just line three. The three and? No, it's line that one and that one. You're saying, I hate everyone who's hip. I hate everyone who's hip, and I hate Jim. Oh, am I saying this wrong? Have I said it wrong? <laughs> I have said it wrong. What, how did I do this? <coughs> everyone I hate is hip, and I hate Jim. Yeah. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Everyone I hate is hip, I hate Jim, therefore Jim has the hipness property. It's just that, yes, as I said. Okay. Okay. Oh, where does this word come from? That was a supposition. Sorry? Four prime was this. Was... This, this one, no, where does this one come from? Sorry? Four prime and five. No. No. It comes from where? Sorry? Two prime and four. So you're saying two prime and you're saying four. Is that clear to everybody? Yep. Yep. Okay. And then what happens? Okay, this is a not and, so we branch. And if we branch one way, it's either Jim's not hip or Jim's not cute, but either way we get the contradiction. Now, is that pretty clear? Okay, now, yes. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. Don't worry, we're coming, we're coming back to this. Now, look, okay. Uh, just, I, let me just give you some of these rules like, uh, like this, just, just to sort of say that you've at least seen them. Implicitly, we've been using them all along. Please note the way that this calculus works. If you assert at i and negation, basically you suck out the negation and you keep that at i moving in deeper into the formula. And for the negated ones, you basically simplify like that. I guess that's completely clear, is it? Do they feel, does that feel, do those two rules feel right? This is just summarizing a bit what we saw implicitly being used there. And again, we saw both of these. So if at i, phi and psi, You've got that, whereas for a negated conjunction, you branch. Either that's false or that's false. Is that okay? Here's one we didn't use, but it will come in later. If I've got at i, at j phi, I can say at j phi. So, go and look, I go, go to i. And that's saying at j phi is true. Well, actually, we didn't really need to go to I in the first place. We could have just gone and said, well, at J phi is true. By the way, this is something I should probably have mentioned earlier. Think about formulas of the form at J anything. Now, think about where you evaluate them. They're either true at all points or false at all points. 
basically at j phi. If phi is true in j, it doesn't matter where you evaluate that formula. You jump to j, you see it's true, and so the at formula is true. On the other word, if phi is false at j, okay, you're false everywhere. And in a sense, that's something to do with this. It's kind of like saying this using i was an unnecessary diversion, so just schlup, and we come down here, and same with the negated thing. If it's not true at i, so that j phi, then it's not true that j phi. You'll see them. They're not the important ones, okay? But now let me give you these rules again. This was the one, the least interesting one, but we did use it a couple of times in this proof. If at i, under all trans r transitions, I see phi, so if standing at the point i, I've got a box claim, so all r transitions lead to phi, and hey, I can go from i via r to k, then at k I've got to pick up this information. The way to think about it, these rules have two premises. You should think of the box there as kind of like this, how can I put it, it's like a, I've got lots of thing. It's like a demon, okay? Like a computer demon, it's waiting to fire. It's a constraint, it's asserting some information about all successes. So this one's just hiding on a tableau branch, waiting to fire. And as soon as you get this existential claim that, in fact, there is some k that stands in the appropriate relation, then it fires. And you put that information on the tableau. And we did that in the previous proof. Okay? But this is the one I want to go on about, because this is the heart. This, all the other rules, in a sense, you can get at in ordinary modal logic. This is the one you can't. This is where the system breaks down in ordinary modal logic. And just to emphasize it, at i, I claim, I can make an r transition and I can see phi. Sure. And what that means is you can make an r transition to some new point that we call j and then assert that at j phi holds. That's how we do the stripping down. Yep. Okay. Now, this should look familiar. Okay? Because let's face it, it really does have the we're doing first order logic flavor. Sorry, I've got very bad eyesight. I can't actually see what time it is. 537? Thanks. Um, okay. Here we are. And that, here's the rule I was just discussing. At I, I can make a diamond transition to some phi information. And the rule I gave you, okay, that's the wrong way. What I want you to consider is what the standard translation into first order logic looks like. Standard translating, this is basically saying, well, there is some y, and the i point where we're standing is related to this y, and phi holds at this i point. Now, the rule I just gave you is this. It's saying whenever I have this sort of information, we break down in this way. We invent a new name, and we insert at that point. But now think, well, what are we doing first order logic? We're looking at that damn existential. Remember in the class, substitute a new name? Well, we would, so to speak, scholomize. We'd invent a new name. Hey, say J. Okay. And we'd scholomize away that, so we get R, I, J, and that. And then we'd break down that. And that's just the standard translation of that, and that's just the standard translation of that. It's first order reasoning but not in first order logic, down in a teeny, teeny, tiny, decidable system. Basically, it's first order logic. And that's maybe one of the other important reasons why hybrid logic is called hybrid logic, because it's kind of like we, we took modal logic and we married it to ideas from first order logic, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> okay, you shouldn't make predictions like that, should you? <laughs> Obviously not sensible. Okay. Let's... Oh, just to finish off, there are a couple of other rules I haven't told you about. I told you that at is basically some kind of like an equality reasoner. So if you've got some nominal on the branch, you're always free to conclude that at i, i. And you've got rules like, well, if at i, j, so the point i is equal to the point j, and we've got the information that at i, phi, then we can conclude at j, phi. These are just the usual analogues of the equality reasoning rules in, mo in first order logic. Okay? But that's pretty much it. I, you, you, you'll get the slides, and they're pretty easy. It's the stuff I already gave you that's important. Now, have a look at this formula. Can somebody tell me if this is a valid formula or an invalid? Can somebody explain what this formula says to me? 
whether it's intuitively valid or intuitively invalid. Sorry? It's valid. Why? No, 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 no. This is saying if you've got this state of affairs, then you're guaranteed to have that state of affairs. Why not? Uh, I'm standing in a world here, and there's two accessibles, and I've got a P there, and I've got a not P there. Okay? Is this valid or invalid? It's a little tricky. It's actually there for a purpose. I mean, I just want you to think about this. It's really for a purpose for tomorrow, not a purpose for today. But yes? I think it's valid because um, the antecedent ensures that you can see two worlds. Very good. And at least two worlds. At least two worlds, yes. yes. And the consequence says, if Q is only true at one world, the I, then yes. Q is not true at one world. And that has to be true because you can see at yeah. least two worlds. That's pretty much it. The antecedent says, OK, I see a P world and a not P world. That is, I see at least two worlds. And coming up here, it sort of says, and also, when I look forward to what I can see, I can, every time I see a Q world, it's true at I. So there's at most one Q world. But if there's two successes, and at most one Q world, there's got to be a not Q world. Okay? Now, it's a nice exercise in Tableau just to try figuring out doing this. There's actually a slightly deeper point for me giving you this example which I may get into tomorrow, but really it's just another, it's just an example for you to do and there's actually, the proof is there, but you should try it yourself. Um, yes? Oh, yes? Sorry, I have a question about uh, this previous slide. So in um, the normal uh, tablet rules for orthodox metalwork, yes. um, the, the decomposition rules for the box and diamond Yes. They look exactly like uh, first order rules for existential and uh, universal classification. But you introduce a new prefix, rather than just as you would introduce uh, a parameter in the first order rules. So, what, so I don't quite understand your point about why hybrid logic has this special connection to <coughs> the first order system. When it looks like you <coughs> What, what I think you're talking about is a particular style of uh, modal tableau, which probably since Dovgebeis' work has come to be known as labeled deduction systems, but actually probably the person who really pioneered it was Melvin Fitting. Yes, Melvin Fitting did this very nice, a very beautiful book called Proof Theory for Modal and Intuitionistic Logic. He basically had this idea that, listen, we've really got to get to grips with the world and all that. So instead of trying to work with ordinary sequent calculi or natural deduction and all this, let's actually create names for worlds that we clip on when we're doing proofs and ways of manipulating them and so on and so forth. And so actually you get proof systems that look rather like this. Now to the next point. What's going on here though is actually very different in a deeper sense. Because all of those things are, how can I put it, they are this meta-theoretic apparatus which are used to guide proofs. These aren't. The nominals and the at operators are not meta-linguistic things. Okay? They are part of the language that you are doing, that you are working with. And that's basically the answer to your question comes up in what I'm going to tell you about reasoning over other models. Okay? <coughs> the Melbourne fitting methods are really nice. Uh, they were developed by Dov Gabay uh, in what he called labeled deductive systems. And then, in, to put the method in a different way, um, to put it in a different way, you could take a Dov Gabay labeled deductive systems and you could write them in such a way that they looked exactly like this. And then you say, okay, we agree on the basic logic. Now, what about richer logics? Say I want a logic that deals with irreflexivity, transitivity, and asymmetry, say. Okay, that's redundant. But let's say I wanted to do this. How do I get a complete logic for that? Dov Gabay's answer would be, I have this metalinguistic labeling apparatus, and I will, find a, I will define an algebraic labeling discipline over it, and that will deal with it. My answer is, I can talk about irreflexivity in the language, I can talk about transitivity, I can, put it, I can talk about asymmetry. 
throw them as axioms, you're complete. Okay? This, so it's a good question, okay? but the answer is this is not metalinguistic apparatus. This is hybrid logic, and now we get all the completeness theorems. That's not just the one basic one. Okay, that's the big difference, but that's a very, very good question. And I think we've just said it, yes? I think I've pretty much just said it, okay? So this gives us a complete proof calculus, but the point is that we can extend it actually in all sorts of ways, but to keep things simply, I'm just going to talk about axioms. Now let's try and motivate this. I'm going to give you another tableau proof to motivate this, where we're going to need some, we're going to need a little bit more. We need to go, to go beyond the basic logic. So if you have a neighbor who only has nice neighbors, then you are nice. Okay? To put it another way, if there is some neighbor, if you have some neighbor, all of whose neighbors are nice, then you're nice. Okay? Because neighborhood is a symmetric relationship, and that's where we're going to need to go beyond the basic calculus. Okay? Uh, by the way, uh, this is the Californian version. I, I didn't dare put up Texan version or something like this. But that would have worked just as well, no matter what I put there in place of nice. It would have worked just as well, because the basic point of the logic is that we're dealing with symmetry here. Okay? I think I better back out of this. Okay, I just sort of, sort of like, okay. So here's the informal argument again. Suppose that some neighbor, you've got some neighbor, all whose neighbors are nice, implies that you're nice. Suppose that it's false, okay? Then, here's the point. It's true of you that there's some neighbor, that you have some neighbor, all of whose neighbor are nice, okay? Uh, but it's false of you that you're nice, okay? This is, this is clear in the informal argument. Yes? Okay? Now, that is, you have a neighbor, let's call him Julio, okay, who only has nice neighbors, okay? That is, all my neighbors are nice is true of Julio, okay? Okay, but neighborhood is a symmetric relation, uh, hence you are one of Julio's neighbors, from which it follows that all of Julio's neighbors are nice, so you must be nice, but we assume that you weren't. So you've got a contradiction, so the original thing must have been true. Let's see how this works. Once again, we start off with the falsification thing. It's not true. We're trying to falsify at an arbitrary point. And once again, I do this, and I think I've wrote it up this time. That was an implication, so I make the antecedent true at i, and I make the consequent false. And as you see, I've already broken down that one, and that's atomic. So basically, I have to go straight into my diamond rule. And here comes Julio. At I, I've got some neighbor. Ah, damn it, let's call him Julio. And at Julio, Julio has the property that all his neighbors are nice. And sadly, now we're stuck, because there's nothing we can do. So what do we do? We go to the next slide, of course. Where it says there is an easy solution. And look at that. In hybrid logic, it's so easy to write down something that clearly expresses the symmetry of the relation. Now, if at i, I can make a neighbor relation to j, then, well, at j, I could have made a neighbor transition to i. Neighborhood is a symmetric relation. So armed with this new thing, we go back to the proof. And from... Uh, Ah, yes, from the point that I have a neighbor called Julio, using the symmetry thing, I say that Julio has a neighbor who's, and now we're in object position, so I have to say me instead of I here. <laughs> okay, so that's good. Okay, now, at I nice. Now, how did I get this? Ah, yes, that's the usual propagation rule using the box. Uh, between three and four, so I must be nice. And unfortunately, I've already said that I'm not nice, so the original thing was good. Now, my real point here is that, okay, it didn't work, but it was pretty easy to introduce a rule that made it work, okay, the symmetry flipping thing, okay? The question is, how far can that push it, or did we just get lucky in that case? Let me give you... What, what time is it, sorry? Do you want to watch? Oh. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, let's let's do this example. Here's a temporal example. Okay, so if time i precedes time j, okay, then time j does not precede time i. So basically, if i comes before j, then I can't loop back from j to i. Okay, time is uh, asymmetric. Okay. So I'm going to use the Arthur Price style tense logic diamonds, and I can write this down here that, look, if I'm at I, and I can move into the future and see J, then it's not true that when I'm standing at J, I can move into the future and see I. Is that clearly capturing what we're saying? Okay. Okay. And the point is that this pretty much is true, we have to accept this is true if we accept two fairly common assumptions about the temporal flow, namely that it's transitive. So if time one comes before time two, and time two comes before time three, then time one comes before time three. And also that it's irreflexive, you know, that no point of time precedes itself. Okay? And let's skip the informal argument. Okay? Let's just see how this works. Okay? I try to falsify this thing at k. So I'm falsifying at k the thing I wrote before. That at i in the future j implies not at j in the future i. And I'm falsifying here. And I press the button. And once again, clamp. I've made this antecedent true at k. And I've made the consequent false with an extra bracket on the end. Okay? <laughs> now. What are we going to do? Well, these are two kind of boring rules. Do you remember? We can always throw away the first one of these things, and these negations here. Oh, these negations here go out. Hold on, let me just do that. Yes. Okay. So we come down to here, we sort of throw away that, and we come down to here. So I've got at i f j and at j f i, and once again, we are completely stuck. Okay? That's where we are. And once again, we go to the next slide and we see the following observations that look, once again, we've got some fairly intuitive tableau rules. Like, if we want to talk about irreflexivity, it seems fair to say that at any time in a tableau proof, for any point i, time is you know, irreflexive, we should be able to say, OK, at i, it is not possible to move forward in time and get to i. No self loops. And this one, well, look, if I see an i goes into the future to j, and j goes into the future to k, then i goes into the future to k. And that's clearly transitivity, right? Okay? And that's what we do, you know. So what do we do here? i goes to j, j goes to i, transitivity, i goes to i. So i is a reflexive point, but the other rule says we're working with irreflexivity, so we pull out the contradiction. Is that clear? Well, so what? Are these just lucky flukes? Okay. Here's the story. One of the nice things in hybrid logic is the power of what I call pure formulas. Okay? And there, when I named them that, there was no attempt to bias the reader in any way as to the sort of the absolute perfection. No, I had to know that. Okay. 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 What is a pure formula? A pure formula is a formula of hybrid logic, and the only atomic symbols it contains are nominals. So there's none of these nasty P's, Q's, and R's, and things like that that we don't, you know, we, you know, no, no, not that I'm prejudiced, okay? okay. We're, all, we're also allowed to use top and bottom if you want, that makes no difference, okay? But we've only got nominals, okay? Now, let's just think about these things. Think about what you can say with pure formulas. Should we cover these up, shouldn't I? Okay. What does this say? I would say that transparently that expresses the reflex it expresses the idea that we've got a reflexive loop at i. At i, I can make a transition and I get back to i. Okay? This one's symmetry. At i, I can make a transition to j implies that at j I can make a transition to i, sort of the, op the opposite of what we used before. This expresses that we've got a symmetrical loop at these points. This one we've pretty much seen before. It's transitivity expresses a formula. 
if I diamonds to J and J diamonds to K, then I diamonds to K. By the way, one thing you'll notice about these things, these are all conditions that we've got formulas for, we've got axioms for, in ordinary modal logic. These are all examples of conditions that we do not have axioms for in ordinary modal logic. None of these do have axioms for in ordinary modal logic. Like irreflexivity. At I, it is not possible to make a transition to I. Okay? Asymmetry. Oh, we just saw that one. If from I get, I get to J, then at J I can't get back to I. Um, oh, this is, this is a nice one. Trichotomy. This is that given two points of time, okay? Well, I, I like to think of it in terms of time, but it's not that important, but you've got two points of time, J and I. It's going to be either B that I, J, you can move forward and see I, or they're the same point, or that at I you can move forward to see J. Basically, it's a very strong notion of linearity. It's called trichotomy because it basically says you've got two points, there's three ways that it can be related. First behind the second, exactly the same, or second behind the first, okay, the trichotomy. <coughs> None of these are expressible in ordinary modal logic. Here we've got axioms for them. I mean, to be a little bit more precise, you can show that any frame, okay, makes this true at all points if and only if it has the corresponding property. It's what modal logicians, these formulas, define these conditions, okay? There are ways of talking about these conditions in a very, very strong way. Okay. Yes. Um, does that assume that uh, every every point uh, is a uh, is named? That's a general. No. Uh, can, okay. I was just trying to get you to see those formulas. Okay. Uh, to intuitively see what they express. When you impose a formula as an axiom, either in ordinary modal logic or in hybrid logic, you're essentially saying you're only interested in working with those models where it's impossible to falsify them. Okay? And for example, uh, this formula, say, for irreflexivity, when you use it, it's certainly possible to falsify that on some models, you know, like basically reflexive points, then it's going to be false. But when you use this as an axiom, like you, you're basically saying, look, I want to work with those models on which it's impossible to falsify. That's what it means to use something as an axiom. And as it happens, what this means is, imposing this as an axiom means you pick out exactly the irreflexive models, or exactly the asymmetric models, or exactly the transitive models. So yes, I wanted you to see what they're saying, but then comes the next step of sort of saying, we use them as axioms, I'm only interested in models that really have these properties overall. The question you're going to ask about whether this means that every point has a name, was that kind of what you were getting at? Yes, it does in a deep sense, okay? And I will kind of indicate whether that's what you do, that's the heart of the completeness theorem that you prove. You show that when you've got a consistent set of sentences, I'll be using this terminology later, you can always build a named model where every point does have a name, and where all instances of these axioms are true, so that you are guaranteed that it's a model that validates these formula. And that's what you do in the completeness result. Okay? So you're dead, dead right, but that's kind of like the technical work that you have to do okay. somewhere down the line. But the big result is we did the technical result once, and now we've got all the completeness theorems, so nobody else has to worry about it. Okay. Okay. But yes, that, that was a very good question. Yes. Um, there's a lot that could be said on that topic, to be honest. Um, ah, damn it, damn it. Dum, 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 dum. Hmm. Actually, that was the completeness theorem. Sorry. Um, basically, okay. Uh, sorry, yes. Um, about the previous slide. Which previous slide? Okay. So, for any branch, you're free to instantiate. No, just the next one. In branch, you're free to instantiate a formula with the nominals occurring on it. What if the uh, formula said something which um, presupposed there was only a certain number of entities in the world, but you already had more names on that branch? Remember, names can uh, uh, 
Was it? Oh, they can name the same thing. Yeah, okay. Honey, honey Bunny and All right, yeah, 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 aliases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I got a bit lost there. Okay, so the basic result that you've got is I gave you that Tableau system and there's a whole bunch of axioms. And the basic result is simply this, that any pure formula works. If you write down a pure formula, it expresses some constraint on graphs, like they're the reflexive, transitive, or whatever. Okay? And what I mean by using that as an axiom on a Tableau, it means that, well, roughly this that you're building a tableau and at any time you're free to introduce these extra axioms onto the tableau. Actually, you only make use of nominals that you've already got onto the branch, so you instantiate in that way, and so on and so forth. But completeness is guaranteed with respect to the classes of models that you've described with the pure formulas. To make that a little bit more concrete, okay, you're interested in working with, because you're working with time, you're interested in irreflexive models, uh, and transitive models, and let's say trichotomous models, so a very linear model of time. So you say, I take the trichotomy axiom, I take the transitivity axiom, I take the irreflexivity axiom. I'm working with the Tableau system I gave you, and at any time in the course of Tableau construction, I'm free to introduce the appropriate instances of these axioms onto the Tableau and just work with them. Okay? What this result says is you can build a model which falsifies your formula, and it ain't just any model. It really is an honest-to-God model that is irreflexive, trichotomous, and transitive. Okay? That's what the result says. So any collection of formulas, you mix and match the pure axioms, stick them on, you've got completeness. By the way, if that sounds really, really good, and I want to be really honest, it is really, really good, and it's really, really nice, okay? Uh, but it's not really, really perfect, okay? So any of you who are really into sort of computational stuff know that one of the nice things about using Tableau is that they're used for implementation. And to be perfectly honest with you, just introducing a bunch of axioms onto the Tableau is just about the yickiest thing you can do, okay? Like, it can be, it's not actually easy to prove always that Tableau systems terminate on any input. That is that the process always stops, okay? But when you start throwing arbitrary axioms onto the Tableau, whoa, 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 whoa. That gets interesting, okay? So it's not perfect, and you know we're struggling at the moment trying to get general results on Tableau termination, and it's really hard actually, okay? So it's nice, but it's not perfect, but yeah, anyway, okay. Uh, though this also works for other proof styles like uh, axioms, and uh, I could say tell you a very similar story about axioms and also about uh, natural deduction. Anyway, so that's the completeness theorem. Uh, there's some other ifs and buts about can we use any pure formula, and the answer is yes. Maybe this is a little bit more interesting. I just sort of said that um, it's a bit hecky to put axioms on the tableau, and very often you can be a bit nicer. So instead of introducing a transitivity formula on, which is yik, why not make use of us? Oh, in the asymmetric one. Why not use the rule I gave you earlier? I diamond J and J diamond I. You know, or or more generally. If the axioms you're adding have this form, a bunch of conjunctions imply a bunch of disjunctions, then whenever you've got that, you could branch the tableau down in this way. Okay? So there's ways of getting nicer rules out of it and so on and so forth, but um, in general, the problem of, of ensuring that you're always nice and computable is a big one. Okay. Sorry, I, I think I sort of slightly lost my uh, flow there. Let me try and get it back. I'd like to ask a deeper question. I'd like to ask a slightly deeper question. I, I won't be able to give you a total answer, but I'd like to at least hint at it. Now, the point is, I've been sort of saying that hybrid logic is very, very natural, and that I'm able to give you a completeness theorem. Now, as I said, I gave it to you in Tableau, but I could have done this for axiom systems. I could have done it for natural deduction theorem. I could have done it for resolution. And it's not just one completeness theorem. It's pretty much an automatic collection of completeness theorems, because it's basically sort of saying, add any pure axiom, you're still complete with respect to what the axioms actually say. And that's nice. Okay. And if you think about it, it's nice in a way that another logic you always know about is nice. It's nice in the way that first order logic is nice. In modal logic, we talk about completeness theorems, plural. In first order logic, we talk about the completeness theorem. In modal logic, we talk about logics. 
We talk about first order logic. Now, why is that? And you all know the answer because in first order logic, the distinction is drawn between the underlying logic, which is complete, the motor of inference, and the theories you build over it. What the completeness theorem for modal logic says is, I derive all the basic logical consequences, but if you want to add some extra axioms, like axioms about linearity, or about Boolean algebras, or about the people in this room and their various relationships, then I will generate every possible valid consequence from that. So the completeness theorem for modal logic, it's one completeness theorem, but it guarantees the completeness of any theory that extends that basis that expressed in first order modal logic. Hybrid logic is not quite so good, but it's pretty near. In a sense, hybrid logic is more like modal, uh, more like first order logic, and there's only one logic. It's not quite true, but you know, kinda. There is <laughs> this. <laughs> no, in fact, there's a very deep reason why it's not, but that's going into a whole other different direction. I don't have time for that here. Um, you've got this basic proof system, and what that results by telling you is that kind of don't think about these other things like reasoning about time as new logics. You just have the theory you're interested in. It really is first order in flavor. You can't add on any bunch of axioms, but any pure axioms you can. And if you really want to know why that works, well, I'm not going to go into this, but under the standard translation, the translation of any pure formula is guaranteed to yield a first order interpretation. And that's kind of where it goes. But there's something else that needs to be said. Okay. Okay. And this brings you back to your this brings me back to uh, this brings me back to your question. You're sort of saying about uh, but don't we need to guarantee somehow that every point has a name or something like that? And the intuition is correct. Okay. But in a sense, if you think about what's going on with these tableau proofs, you see that you've got to get that. What do we do with the tableau proof? We negate the damn thing, okay, and we smash it away. If all the branches have contradictions on, we know we've proved the thing. But if there is an open branch, an open branch is essentially a specification of a possible model. Now I say specification, a description, a blueprint of a model. What would be written on an open branch of a tableau? Well, after you've smashed the living hell out of everything as far as you possibly can, basically what you're going to have on the tableau is stuff like this. You're going to have statements like, well, at the point named I, P is true. And at the point named J, say, Q is false. You're basically going to have a specification of what atoms are true where. You're going to have stuff like at ij, which is basically, hey, the point named by i is the same as the point named by j. You're going to have stuff like, I don't know, at k diamond l. From k, you can make a transition to l. In other words, if you apply all the tableau rules and you smash everything right down to mincemeat, what are you left with? Formulas of this form. In short, you are left with a Robinson diagram, remember yesterday, a full description of what the model has to look like. That's why it works. And if you think about it, every point on the tableau, remember we were working with all these prefixes, we start with the initial one, we introduce new prefixes with the diamond rule, but we're always behind a prefix. Every point is going to be named. Now do you see it? Yeah, we do need the points. We do need the names, but we've got them. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Name models are important. I just said that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, can we adapt these ideas to other proof styles? Well, yes, we can. Uh, Joe Seligman did a lot. Uh, Sequent calculi, natural deduction. A colleague of mine at Roskiller. Tobin Breuner, he's written a good book on proof styles for hybrid logic, um, and so on and so forth. I will briefly give you a couple of slides on natural deduction. 
Natural deduction works kind of nice. Actually, there's various styles of natural deduction. There's also what we call Seligman style, which is, works very, very differently. But that's nice. Look, you've got the sort of typical natural deduction stuff. So here, you can see that the arrow elimination basically applies modus ponens at the point i. Is that clear? And over here, you've got, well, you make the assumption that at i phi, you deduce that at i psi, you discharge and you conclude that at i phi implies psi. Yeah? But the really nice ones is this one. This is the nice rule. Your assumption is that you're standing at a point i, and you can make a transition point to some point called j. So basically your assumption is I can make a transition. And then it's yada, 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 and you conclude that, hey, and at j I've got this information. Now here's the logic. j was arbitrary, so you conclude at i box phi. That's the nice rule. Okay? Sorry? You don't get that? No, no. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this one basically is also like the tableau rule we use that if at i box phi and at i you can get to a k by the same relation, then at k phi. So that's basically kind of the same sort of saturation rule. Okay. And there's an example there for you. Uh, this stuff is in fact implementable, but you need to be careful. I will have to put my hands on my heart. I will have to tell you, I did not explain to you the most super optimized version of the Tableau system. I just wanted something nice and easy to explain. But uh, proving termination for that thing, even if it does termination, would be horrible. Okay? Getting, making sure that the basic Tableau system really does terminate the way you want is sort of an exercise in frustration, which has been successfully mastered, thank goodness. This has been implemented. So there's a system called HTAB, which was implemented at Nancy by Carl Sorethes and uh, Guillaume Hoffman. And um, it's a good prover. It's been optimized in quite a few ways. It's very, very fast. And it was the best hybrid logic prover around. It was really, really fast. But then the guys over the border at Zabrucken came along, and Gert Smolka and Mark Kaminsky with the, with the Spartacus prover, which, <laughs> which I have to admit that is one damn good prover. OK? <laughs> what is interesting, though, and this is interesting, Tableau methods, when it comes to implementing modal logic, historically, or description logic in particular, which is kind of like a very close relative. Historically, they are the way of doing, of implementing modal deduction. Modal resolution, you just don't want to do, trust me. I did papers on modal resolution and the rules are unreadable and, you know, basically it's the same old thing. You've got a diamond there and you've got to get some sort of resolution rule that somehow extracts the information so you can resolve and it's, it's yicky, okay? <coughs> Carlos, for many years, was, uh, pushing the line that one of the nice things was with hybrid logic, you'd crossed over into resolution space. And he had implemented a good prover called Hilo Res uh, with a variety of, it's actually basically an Argentinian prover because pretty much everybody who worked on it was Argentinian and they were all really good programmers. Mm -hmm. It's a really good program though and he did come up with nice ideas like taking ideas from first order logic to optimize the resolution process and they did work. Though it has to be said that at the moment HTAB and Spartacus are basically knocking the living crap out of it. Okay, so, but it was the first prover, but so, but there's an idea there. I mean, I think Carlos still believes in his heart of hearts that ultimately resolution will be the way to go, but he's the only one who really believes it. Okay? So, um, summing up, okay, so this was a slightly weird lecture since it was a little more technical and a little less conceptual than the other ones. Basically, orthodox modal logic demands proof methods that are applicable to a wide range of logics. But, because it is hard to extract information from under the scope of diamonds, it has been forced to rely on Hilbert systems or Axiom systems, thereby, thereby sacrificing ease of use. So basically, the new tools offered by the basic hybrid language, basically nominals and I, enable us to define usable proof systems such as Tableau and natural deduction, basically because we can grab the information that we need out from under the nose of the diamonds. Okay? And uh, they do generalize a lot. They can be implemented, and that's pretty much it. I will also sort of say that this was a surprise. Hybrid logic was, to, was invented, I would say, primarily for semantic reasons. Okay? It's been independently invented at least three times by the Bulgarian Sophia school people, by me, by Arthur Pryor. Not one of them has got a proof theoretical bone in their body, except for Arthur Pryor, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, all very, very semantic -y people who are innocent of things like Tableau and all this and only do them when we're forced to, okay? <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, it works. 
And so this was something that took us by surprise, so I have a surprise to you too. Okay, good. That's, that's it for today.